I just wanted to spend a moment sharing the story of Abdul Azadi in its kind of full form, uh, particularly for audiences who are British and may not have been following it on a sort of daily basis, because I think it really summarises, A, the madness of where we're at, um, the same template being used in lots of different countries and how all the institutions and things we thought we could believe in or have faith in are all part of undermining um, the countries that we live in. So, Abdul Azadi, he's an asylum seeker, he's an illegal. Uh, he's over here, he gets rejected, I think it's twice. And then finally, he has his asylum approved. And the reason it got approved is because he found uh, someone from the church who was willing to say that he was a regular attender. He attended services recently. He was being baptised as a Christian and it would be a danger to his uh, life if he would be returned because he's now a Christian and so he needed to be protected. So the church working with illegals, as we know, in order to help them get asylum uh, status in whatever country they're trying to break into. So he goes on, he has sexual offences, he's on the sex offenders register, uh, he commits criminal acts. And of course, those are just the ones we know about. Who knows what else these people get up to? So same you know, story in Canada, in America and all of the places that I've been. Next up, Abdul Azadi is dating a woman. He's seeing a lady who's got children and she ends the relationship. I mean, I would add at this point, what the hell is a woman doing in a relationship with someone like that? And uh, surely to God, there's better men out there for, for ladies with children. But that's, you know, that's a that's really a personal thing in there. And that's not helpful to the conversation. So she's finishing with him and she doesn't want to see him anymore. And then one way or another, they end up in a car together, presumably to have a conversation or however he tricked her into being in that car. And her two children are also in the car. And some horrific incident happens, uh, which is obviously premeditated on his part because he has a highly corrosive, toxic, alkaline substance. So the effective, an acid attack, but this time with alkaline and other horrific things happen that bystanders have reported. And I don't think the details are helpful, but essentially kids being thrown onto the ground as if to break them completely uh, this alkali liquid being thrown all over the woman, uh, that woman's life being changed forever if she makes it intensive care. We still don't know what the outcome will be for her. And, you know, as an, a personal opinion, you do wonder sometimes, don't you, whether you want to come round from those sorts of things. I mean, really. So just the most vile creature ever during the attack on the woman and her kids he throws acid somehow or spills it onto himself. And in CCTV footage later, you see, he, and you know CCTV footage is sometimes difficult, it's sometimes grainy, certainly the stuff they release to the public is never of a high quality. You can see half his face is missing. From here downwards, it's also his whole eye, his cheek, everything must have been eaten away. And if you know about acid or alkali attacks, you know that that stuff keeps eating and literally dissolves flesh as it goes. So there's this monster with half a face, flesh still dissolving, walking around a Tesco to try and get water. So a supermarket. Um, and then the manhunt is on. Now, if you're someone like myself, I passionately believe that he will be sheltered by his own kind. Um, and I don't just say that out of some casual throwaway commentary. I say this having spent a month uh, living and working in the jihadi capital of Europe, Molenbeek. And in Molenbeek, Molenbeek is in Belgium. It's just over the bridge from the European Parliament. And that bridge divides darkness and evil from politicians and pretending that there's a Europe to look after. Molenbeek is where jihadis have come from, where they live. And after the horrendous Bataclan slaughter in Paris, those murderers came back to Belgium, to Molenbeek, where they'd got all of their armoury, their weapons, 
and they were hidden by the community. And here's what I was told in person, face to face, with someone else present, a camera guy. So a leftist organisation in Molenbeek getting European funding in order to maintain community relations, in order to keep a good relationship between the people of Belgium and the people of Molenbeek, essentially to keep the kind of Islamists, you know, vaguely contented so that so that things wouldn't kick off. The leftist organisations, Christian leftists knew where the murderers were, the Bataclan terrorists, but they wouldn't disclose where they were to the police because they didn't want to lose their funding to keep community relationships preserved with the Islamist community that lived just over the bridge from the EU capital. So that template, I think, is exactly the same for Abdul Azidi. Those who agree with what he did, those who agree that you should punish women, those who think women are nothing, those who would carry out honour killings themselves, or those who just listen to the teaching of Islam that says, even if a Muslim does wrong, it is your duty to protect them. I mean, whatever explanation you want to come up with based on whatever book, I don't really care. I just know firsthand communities will reach out and hide these people. So the Met Police obviously get a sense of that or know that or know he's being hidden or know he's being helped. So they offer a reward and the reward they offer is £20,000. Now, the idea of that, as you'll understand, is that an individual hiding that person might not want to tell about uh, Abdullah Zaidi in their attic. But someone that knows that person or someone that knows someone that knows someone, £20,000 oh, I'd like to claim that. So it usually flushes them out that way. And that hasn't happened. So finally, on Friday, and today's date is now, it's now Tuesday, but on Friday, just before the weekend, the police briefed the press in an embargoed press statement that went out for the six o'clock news bulletins. Briefed the press so they were ready in place outside New Scotland Yard that Abdul Azadi probably went into the Thames because he was seen walking up and down the Thames on CCTV, that he's most likely drowned and most probably his body will never be found. And that was the official Met Police verdict on the Friday to kill the Abdul Azadi story. And outside the uh, Scotland Yard sign, that silver sign, so I ran down there, I was in London, and all of the TV crews assembled Uh, BBC for the six o'clock hit, ITV for the six o'clock hit and then the nine o'clock or ten o'clock. Channel four there for the seven o'clock hit twice before the eight o'clock hour. All of the media there ready, having been spoon fed, you know, the press release embargoed so they can plan the stories. They're there with their cameras and then they tell the world what the police have told them to say, which is that Abdul Azadi, who... I mean, attacked, I'm going to go with that word, a lady with with, ruined her life, if she lives, and her children, and is a monster. He's gone into the Thames, his body will never be found. That's it. Draw a line under it. It's the, you know, it's the weekend. We don't need people talking about this guy anymore. We'll just draw a line under that by saying he's in the Thames. And bear in mind, you know, London now, if you do 20, if if you're a white person, and you do 23 miles an hour in a 20 mile an hour zone, there is CCTV footage of you. There is CCTV footage of you in your car, of your car, of your car number plate. I mean, they could probably see, you know, my earrings on CCTV. If I was to do, if I was to do throw litter in London, which I would never do, the CCTV would be able to show what earrings I had on. You know, that's the level of surveillance as we know we're under, but somehow, We don't have any idea where Abdul is, but he's definitely in the Thames. Sure. Cut to media compliant, you know, complicit, showing pictures of the Thames at night. Well, yeah, the Thames at night. It's a river. It looks dark. It looks a bit scary. It always has done. That's how rivers look at dark. You know, it just it's so insulting when they come up with this kind of footage. Here's the Thames at night. Yeah, okay. But there's no images of him getting in the water or jumping from the bridge or anything else. 
get this. So that's Friday. That's drawn the line under it. Saturday, I'm guessing this is just more for the optics of the thing. A search team is on the Thames and they start at 10, I believe. At 10.15, they find a body of a male in the Thames, having been looking for about 10 minutes, they find a body. It's not Abdul. And they know it's not Abdul because he's not missing half a face. At 10.39, less than 30 minutes later, I'm not patronising you, I'm just laying this out clearly, they find another body in the Thames, another body. It's a male. It's not Abdul. Within the space of 30 minutes on the Thames, one Saturday morning, two bodies. Neither of them are Abdul and they're currently being um, classified as unexplained bodies in Thames. I mean, many, many questions. How many bodies are there in the Thames if you can find two in half an hour on a Saturday morning? If you're never going to find the body of Abdul Azadi because it's the Thames and it's fast flowing, why are you finding two bodies in about 15 minutes? They stop looking at that point because they can't afford to find any more bodies because they're trying to draw a line under this. And drawing a line under it is difficult when you're getting two bodies every half hour. They're like, get out the water, quit, lads. Get out. Stop fishing bodies out the Thames. Christ. So that, and that is all brushed away as if nothing to see here, nothing to see. And that's the story of one illegal, who was given asylum here. And then you multiply that out by millions and millions and millions. And why do you think we're in the state that we're in? And what's, I guess, I mean, that's at a sort of uh, emotional level or a volume level, you know, at the kind of micro level of the individual or the groups of individuals, human beings. But if you go to the macro level or the strategic level or what I would call the structural scaffolding of a country level, this is the thing I always bang on about in America, the structural scaffold of a country that would be its democracy, that would be, you know, its parliaments, that would be law and order, that would be police, that would be, um, you know, things like the media in the old days where the media was actually there to try and, you know, bring truth to people. All of those macro, 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 not mackerel, it's not a fish, structural scaffolding stuff is all complicit. Church, complicit. Oh, he's a Christian. He should stay. Media. Oh, mm, spoon fed us the story mm, mm, that he went in the Thames and we'll show a picture of how fast the water's moving. Police you know, oh, he's definitely in the Thames, even though there's no footage, even though this is a surveillance state. All of those structural um, pillars that should be there to hold up a country actually working together to ensure its demise. And refusing ever to leave a story on a negative. There is a lots of comedy in that story. Two bodies in the Thames in half an hour when they're not supposed to find any dead bodies like buses you wait for one three come along at once none of them with half a face and there's comedy in just the bizarreness of of this country but uh i guess the positive is that we all see this now we see this same thing you guys in canada or in america america or um you know many of the countries will be watching this go same 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 catholic charities on the southern board, same same it's the same thing. And the more that we speak it, the more that we keep speaking, calling this out, uh, the more that people are starting, even those who who weren't with us on loads of different subjects. You know, on this, lots of people can go, well, that doesn't sound quite right. And the more that we bring people who go, well, that doesn't sound quite right, the more that we win. Ha! Ah there's always a positive. Um, so wishing you all the best. I just wanted to bring you that brief <laughs> story of Abdul Izzedi. And if you want to look him up yourself, his surname is E-Z-I-D-I. -I. Abdul Izzedi, the guy that definitely went into the Thames and definitely drowned. And you'll never find his body because there's too many bloody bodies in the Thames for us to find the right one. Perfect. Nothing to see. Nothing to see here. Nothing. No, every, everything's 